God, we bless your name. We ask that you have your way in this place. Speak to our hearts, Holy Spirit, and grant that we hear you. We ask, God, that your Holy Spirit will just overshadow us and that in the end we might give you all the glory, the honor, and the praise for what you do in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. For those of you that are able, I'm going to be reading from Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. Only if you're able, you can stand for the reading of the word. Mark chapter 6. If you don't mind, I'm going to uh, start down at verse 34. Mark chapter 6, I'm going to start at verse 34. And Jesus, when he came out, saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion for them because they were like sheep not having a shepherd. So he began to teach them many things. When the day was now far spent, his disciples came to him and said, this is a deserted place and already the hour is late. Send them away that they may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. But he answered and said to them, You give them something to eat. And they said to him, Shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat? But he said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they found out, they said, Five and two fish. Then he commanded them to make them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. May the Lord bless the reading and hearing of his holy word. You may be seated in the sanctuary. I want to talk this morning uh, from a little bit of a strange topic. We're at the midway now of our year. Uh, we're a little beyond midway this year, and this year has been the year of the Lord's favor manifested. This has been the year of the Lord's favor, of the Lord's manifested favor. God has done tremendous things, and each of us has been sitting in our own tent door as God gave us that pronouncement of his favor and that we would see it this year. Many times we've known we've had it on us, but from the beginning of the year, God spoke, we'd see it. We'd see something different. It'd be manifested. That's what the word means. It means it, it materialized. It actually came to pass that we saw it. And this morning, I want to I wanna take a few minutes. I want to take a few moments, minutes this morning. Uh, and I want to talk about the same idea, but I want to talk this morning about unsolicited manifested favor unsolicited manifested favor <clears throat> in case you didn't know when we read the text there's nowhere in the text where anyone in the crowd complained of hunger pains there's nowhere in the text where anybody in the crowd said uh, I'm getting hungry I wish somebody would find me a sandwich there's nowhere in the text where anybody in the crowd went to any of the disciples and said, is there a meal program that's going on here? We've been hearing your preacher all day. Looks like you ought to have the meals on wheels roll up on us about now. We've been out here a long day. It's hot out here and I didn't bring any extra food and I haven't had any water. There's nothing in the text that suggests that there was any complaining. Maybe I missed it. But there were no complaints from the congregation that they were not there satisfied. They were in the presence of Jesus. Jesus was in the midst of preaching and they were not complaining about anything. People were coming and going. They were in his midst, and they were not complaining about anything. It was the observation of the leadership 
of the apostles that says, it's getting late. You should pronounce the benediction, send them home to get them something to eat, because this, in case you have forgotten, is a deserted place. Now, I thought I would just help you out here with this, this warm, informative moment to Jesus. Since Jesus picked the spot, I think he knew where he was. After all, he's the one that decided to go to the other side to rest a little while. And since he knew where he was, they're informing him of the location where he is does not help at all. They, they could seem to want to emphasize to Jesus how important, how, how immediate he needs to, there's an exigency here. Lord, it's getting dark out, it's late, people are hungry. We just want to emphasize they're a long way from town. But notice, the people have not asked for anything. Now, 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 this is not a knock on prayer because I do believe prayer changes things. But I want to say a word about what happens when you learn how to hang close to God. Because see, if you're in the presence of the Lord, Blessings are going to happen that you didn't even have to ask for. You, you didn't have to say anything. He's going to recognize what you need. You can't be in his presence and not have him look at your situation and say, how can I bless my daughter? How can I bless my son? How can I work in their lives to make their human condition better while they're here? What can I do to make a miracle for them? I you see in truth the Bible describes this situation that they were on the other side of the water and when they heard, saw Jesus moving away from them they ran around the edge so they could be close to him and the word of God simply says that when Jesus saw them he had compassion on them. And the Bible says he looked at them as sheep without a shepherd. Okay, watch. You, you, you trying to say something? Yeah, yeah, watch. Come on back here. It's important that you get this. When Jesus sees them, he sees them not as the individuals they are, but as Israel personified in front of him. He sees them as a people who have not been getting good word. He sees them as a people torn between two factions of ministry. One faction that wants to keep to traditionalism, another faction that's over there trying to ache in pain about how to live life in a specific way. He's trying to look at them. He said, look, these folk are not getting what they need. They're not getting the word the way they need it. They're not attaching themselves to the Father the way they need. They're in the midst of a situation where they are lost and they don't know what to do. They're still sheep, but there's no shepherd here. And he looks at them, and instead of being tired of them, instead of being mad about them, losing his leisure time, he has compassion on them. It's a desert place. A lot of good things happen in the desert. It was in the desert where Moses saw a burning bush. A lot of good things can happen in the desert. You, you don't have to worry about being in a desolated place for God to bless you. I don't care where you are, wherever you may be, God can meet you where you are and bless you where you are. Don't worry about being in your desolated place. Don't worry about being in your desert. God has met people in the desert before and set the world on fire through them. I don't care where you are right now. If you want to meet the Lord, the Lord wants to meet you. I just, here, here, they're, they're, they're there, they're there, and Jesus sees them, and I think that there's something to be said 
You see, they followed him and then they fellowship with him. And see, you can't follow and fellowship with him without him feeding you. I'm trying to work with this for a moment here. Because if you follow him and you fellowship with him, he's going to feed you. He, if you bless him, you stay close to him. Let me work this back another way. Since he blessed them, when they were there, he fed them spiritually the word of God. But their physical needs still needed to be met. And God not only cares about your soul, he cares about your body as well. He's a holistic God. He cares about you, mind, body, and soul. He had already fed their spirits. Now he's about to feed their flesh. I don't need a God that can't see me cry. I need a God that can see my tears and handle my tears. The psalmist says he takes my tears and puts them in a bottle. I do believe that God examines every tear of a saint to decide just what you're going through. And upon examination, he sends the blessing that is the prescription and the antidote to your tears. God has a way of working it out in your life and changing things. Here they are. They're in a desert place. And the disciples come up to him and they say, Jesus, what are we going to do? Pronounce the benediction. And I think that there are some things going on in this disciple relationship with Jesus that might give us a window in to God's care about people and how God works miracles. Y'all don't mind? Four quick things. I, I know I've got to go, but four, four quick things to take home, put in your giddy up bag and hold on to. When they come to him, the first thing Jesus does is he acknowledges their anxiety. Now, now you, you don't even know when to shout. <laughs> it, that, 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 that's exciting right there because my problem is there are too many times I get around people who are indifferent to what I'm going through. There are too many times I get around people, and there's nothing worse than you being all upset and the person you talk to has no compassion, doesn't look at you like they care, they're looking at you like you could go fall out. You got, listen, there's nothing like getting around somebody who sees your hurt and understands what you're going through, who reaches down with you and enters your case with you and says, I love you in the... Well, he acknowledges their anxiety. Lord, we're not just being jerks here. We're not being idiots. We, we think there's a serious problem here. We've got at least, scripture says, 5,000 men. Now, I don't know how they do their counseling, their counting mechanism, but 5,000 seems like a pretty good group of people there. They got 5,000 and, and, and they said, Lord, we're getting anxious. Because sooner or later, somebody, somebody going to get sick here. It, we, we're in a desert place. The, 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 the locale has one other piece to it. If it's a deserted place, it may have been that there were no trees around to offer any cooling either. And there was nowhere to buy food at, at the same time. They had an anxious moment because they cared what was going on. They also, they also, y'all excuse this part because I want to talk to my leaders here. Without saying it, they may have been also saying something else. If you read back in the text, they got through telling their testimony of having been out preaching and they shared their testimony with Jesus and the scripture says they did not have any time to eat. So the truth of the matter is, 
they may have been talking about the people being hungry. What they really might have been saying is, we hungry. And they're projecting their hunger. Well, they've been out here a long time, too. They got to be hungry, too. We can't just go up and tell them to, to quit church right now so you can go feed us. Tell them the people need to eat. Y'all excuse me. I just, I got to hustle. I got to hustle. No, and Jesus acknowledges it. I, and I thought that I just wanted to pause to tell somebody who thinks that God doesn't care, that you can cast all of your cares upon him. For he cares for you. Would you help me right now preach this sermon and just look at somebody and just tell them God cares. Tell, tell them like, tell somebody else God cares. Tell them, tell them God cares. No, you ought to say it like you mean it. God cares. The, the second thing is, see, here, Jesus is there, and he, he, he hears what's going on. And, and the second thing in the text is, he says, I want to access what's available. So God accesses what's available. Yeah, I, I need you to go and find out what do we have? Let me help you right here. Miracles can happen, but don't ever think you don't need to put some skin in the game. See, see, somebody in here, you want everybody to do everything for you. What you putting up? What are you going to do? How are you going to participate in your next miracle? Because see, God wants to bless you, but don't you think that you get to just have blessings and have no part in creation of the blessing? Because when you look at this miracle, they have to participate even though they don't have a whole lot. Uh, I, I'll come back to this uh, later on, not, not this morning, but, but I'll come back to this. If you look at miracles, they start out with something and end in much more. I believe that the reason God does that is that he wants you to know that your role in time can trigger what he can do in eternity. I don't have to have it all, but I need enough to get it started. Okay. Um, I, I'm, I'm never, I was a Boy Scout, but no one was a great Boy Scout. I was a Boy Scout, but uh, I like hunting and then being in the woods and I want to tell y'all a secret if you ever get stuck in the woods and you need to start a fire it doesn't take a lot if you know what you're doing to create a fire that'll keep a whole group warm You sing a song, uh, but Jose, you sing a song. It only takes a spark to get a fire going. I'm just trying to measure up, y'all. Y'all, stay with me for a minute. Let me, let me give it to you like this. If God wants to bless you, can you at least provide a spark? All right, let me, let me. The, the, the second thing, the, the, he assesses, he, he accesses what's available, but when they come to him, they come to him and, and they say, uh, Lord, uh, first of all, they're kind of sarcastic. 
you know, there's always one in every church. I don't know where he's at. I'm looking on these both sides here. I'm looking on both sides here. There's always one there, church. There's always one. There's always one, you know. Look here. Are we supposed to go and take the whole treasury to feed this mob just because you want to talk to him? Shut up. Okay, no, listen. Here he is. They tell them what he had. So I said initially that Jesus accesses what's available, but then he also assesses what's attainable. Okay. I need to assess, count up, figure out what we have so I can tell you what we can do. So we got, uh, how many people? Y'all, y'all, either y'all didn't read the scripture or y'all went to sleep right then. How many people? Thank you so much. I love participatory preaching. We're going to get this done. We got 5,000 people and we got how many loaves of bread? There's a problem here. Now, I don't care if it was five grown men, five little, little biscuits are not going to feed them. Stay with me for a moment. Do you realize that many times in life, when we look at our life situations, everything seems like it's overwhelming. And if it all depended on you, it probably is. But since it doesn't, All right. I, if you have to do it by yourself, you might not be able to do too much. But if you've got good backup that has one foot in time and the other in eternity, you can see something happening that would not have happened if he had not stepped in. I got, I got two things I want to get across before I get off this point and I'm almost done for the morning because uh, I want to get y'all out to the park. I really do. Two things I want to get across. One thing is I want you to change your perspective. Because see, if you see defeat in every victory, you're going to lose. Hello? You're going to lose. I, I was, uh, the whole world has been going coco crazy because of our young little sister who was playing over there at Wimbledon. Coco was just, woo, 15 years old, playing on center court at Wimbledon. I'm sitting there. Now, the first match against Venus, oh, she might get her. I'm watching, you know, I like, I like a little. Okay, I had to go. Second match, wait a minute. And then the announcer said, with every point, she is believing more and more in herself. I want to tell you a little, little secret about sports. The difference between the best athlete and the least has nothing to do with skill because they all practice the same jump shot, they all practice the same slap shot, they all do the same kicks, the same putts, whatever it is, they all do the same. It has more to do with what's in here and what's here than any skill. Okay. Um, when I was in school, I'm, I'm going to tell this real quick. My, my son thought he had went to the worst school in the world for a minute there. He got, he got over it for when I explained to him about my school. Uh, <laughs> he had to get over it. He had to get over it. There had some rules there, Ms. Washington. He had to get over them rules. It was rough. 
When I went to school, I went to school in Selma, Alabama. Selma, Alabama, a little tiny school, so small, you might not even find it on the map. You can find the city, but not the school. Listen. So I'm in school in Selma, Alabama, down there. Now you have to go to chapel. You cannot miss chapel. Now, I was already preaching when I was in college. So I'm being up front now, because some of y'all gonna put this together. Y'all know I started real young. So yes, I was preaching. But to be a chaplain at eight o'clock in the morning, when you've been studying all night, you know there were some mornings when you woke up and said, Jesus knows my heart. Okay. But I had to go, because you had to sign your name, fill out a slip, because they kept attendance. And if you didn't go, the repercussions at the end of the year were not good. Okay, so I went to chapel. And I would have still had a problem with chapel, but I went to chapel one morning, and they had an old man up there told an old story he must have heard 100 years ago. But it blessed my heart about perspective. And when he finished, it changed everything for me. It really did mess me up. Old man just stood up, he started talking about perspective. He said, he said the, the young salesman was sent to Africa. The young salesman gets sent to Africa, he's getting sent over there to sell shoes. He's a shoe salesman. This is an old, old story. He goes over there, he finally arrives in Africa to sell shoes. He doesn't even have a plane ride, he has to go by boat. He gets over there, after he arrives, he stays there for about a week or two, sends back a telegram to tell them that he'd be coming back home soon because nobody here wears shoes. They came on back home, they sent another young salesman over. Young salesman gets over there to Africa, he's over there. He sends back a telegram in a few weeks and, and, and they're expecting the same message. But his telegram was a little different. His was, send all the shoes you have. Everybody here needs shoes. <laughs> Let me help you here. As long as you keep thinking defeated, you will be defeated. As long as you think God can't fix it, he will not fix it. But the moment you get in your mind that the power of God is greater, then you can see miracles happen even though you will not be able to explain how they... Okay. Gotta hurry, gotta hurry. Gotta hurry. I, I, he, he, here's what... Here's what, here's what happens. Jesus says, tell them to sit down. Tell them to sit down. And, and when you tell them to sit down, let them sit in groups. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't know how sitting in a group is gonna make this food any more than what it was when we were sitting together. I don't understand how sitting in a group is going to change the dynamics of what's happening here. But what you need to understand is this. God can supply what you need despite what it looks like. Y'all don't hear me. God, 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 can, God can make up for what you don't have despite what it looks like. See, God has a way of, uh, of augmenting your apportionment. He can augment that which you had. I know you didn't have much, but little can become much. When you place it in the master's hand, 
I got, I got to get out of the way. Hey, the, the Bible says that in the time of Elisha, Elisha had a group of men around him who were hungry. And the Bible says they brought to him a first fruits offering. And all he did was take the first fruit offering and he blessed it. And they were worried that they weren't going to feed everybody. But when they were finished, they had leftovers, according to 2 Kings chapter 4. Because once he blessed it, God had a way of stretching it. You want something stretched, you have to bless it. The Bible says that Jesus took the bread and he broke it and he blessed it. And I don't know if it was between the breaking or the blessing, but somehow then Jesus started to pass out the bread to the men. And he kept on passing out bread. And I'm sure they kept looking and said, he's got to be down to the last biscuit. But no, he passed it out to the apostles. And they kept getting up and coming around and pass. And he kept on passing it out to the apostles and passing it out. Bring this to group over there and bring that to group over there. Jesus, where you getting it from? Jesus, how you doing this? I'm blessing it and I'm passing it out because I'm augmenting what you've given me to work with. If you give me something to work with, I'll augment it. I'll expand it. I'll bless it above and beyond that which you can think if you just give it to me. I'll bless it. And that's why you see the deacons go around handing out communion and passing it to you because I'm still trying to bless it. And they're still trying to hand it because every first Sunday you're in the midst of a love feast. You're in the midst of a blessing. We're just sitting here knowing that the God we serve expands the table and blesses his people. He's going to bless you. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed, 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 oh, oh blessed. Do me a favor and give God a praise right there.